Hey there, and welcome to period six of the AP US History Study Guide on the Gilder Lehrman website. This period focuses on the time between 1865, with the close of the Civil War, to 1898 as the nation geared up for a brand new century and all that the future held. At this point, the United States had begun its transformation from an agricultural nation to one that was comprised of an increasingly industrialized and urbanized society. Like all sections of this study guide, three major themes or key concepts will govern our discussion. For this period, we'll call these big business, big cities, and big changes. Let's first talk about big business. In the 35 years before 1900, America was transformed into a modern industrial society. Here's a couple things to keep in mind. Manufacturing and factories grew at a very rapid pace. Urban centers exploded. The growth of American cities paralleled this rapid industrial development. As workers flooded the manufacturing centers, cities became home to communities of workers and migrants from all over the world. Regardless of their origins, Italian, Irish, German, American, or Chinese, life in American cities was not easy for all who came. For many, the new industrial order changed their lives. City life was not as simple as many had hoped. While thousands of unskilled workers labored for new corporations, deep divides separated wealthy capitalists and poor workers. While the poor scraped by to earn a substandard living, the industrialists made millions and lived lavishly. During this time of big business, there were always those who made the big money. John D. Rockefeller was the man who spent his life developing the Standard Oil Company, made billions of dollars, and understood the ferocity that must be employed to gain the competitive edge in an industry. Standard Oil, through marginally acceptable business practices, and sometimes not so acceptable, gained a controlling share of the oil industry during this time. Next we have Andrew Carnegie. He was the baron of U.S. Steel. An immigrant himself, Carnegie brought the story of Horatio Alger to life. His staunch work ethic and innovation around the development and manufacture of cheap, quality steel allowed him to make hundreds of millions of dollars by the time he sold his company in 1901. Yet, in 1901, he was worth more than $475 million. Next, we have J.P. Morgan, a financier who, through many different partnerships, was able to amass an amazing amount of wealth by working with industrialists to consolidate wealth and develop financial portfolios. The dominant factory system becomes central to an efficient manufacturing sector of the American economy that demands the maintenance of a permanent low-wage workforce. An economy that operated free from local, state, or federal government intervention emerged and surged forward. This begs the question, if a small, concentrated portion of society enjoys the spoils of industrialization, what happens to those who make up the rest of the population? As Americans all over the nation lived within a breath of poverty, people began to organize around issues of labor. This did take some violent situations, strikes, and a whole lot of angst, but unions organized workers in different industries around better working conditions and earning a living wage. The inequities of business also resulted in the development and passage of antitrust legislation. This prohibited single corporations from owning or influencing a majority share of an entire industry. This was solidified with the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. With all of this in the air, there was also a sense among the mega-rich that they should give back some or a great deal of their fortunes to the American people. First we have Carnegie and what's become known as his gospel of wealth, which led to his overwhelming and at this point unheard of philanthropy. His philosophy was simple. Earn your money and work hard to earn lots of it. But when it comes time, give that wealth back to society. It came in the form of school buildings, amazing library buildings, and universities. Another good example would be Rockefeller's philanthropy, especially with the purchase and donation to the public, massive tracts of land in the name of environmental conservation. To take a deeper dive into this information, check out the many documents on the Gilder Lehrman study guide, including the Haymarket Affair from 1886, anti-corporate cartoons from 1900, and building Carnegie Hall from 1889. Now we come to our second key concept, big cities. To do this right, we'll have to expand this concept a bit and call it big cities and big issues, urbanization and immigration and social change. Regardless of your place on the socioeconomic ladder, urban centers provide an increased potential for employment. As a result of this influx of business and people, American cities became financial centers of the nation, and some, including New York City, achieved the same on a global scale. By the 1890s, America's largest cities included Boston, at around a half million people, Philadelphia, Chicago, and finally New York City at more than three million people. Now let's turn our focus to immigration. Why did immigrants flock to the larger city centers in America? Here are some truths to consider, and we'll use New York City as our main example. The Lower East Side of New York City became a magnet for Italian and Jewish immigrants. This area was crowded, it was dirty, and it had no transportation. So why would people want to live there? For the newly arrived, extraordinarily poor people, there was cheap rent, employment for substandard wages, 
and they also had family and friends that could provide support, even if it was only moral. Between older waves of immigrants and newly arriving masses, the American population underwent a massive facelift. By 1890, immigrants became almost 15% of the entire population. Let's talk for a moment about the reforms that urban centers experienced during this time. Women's rights and their role in American society became a large part of the American dialogue during this era. We see the start of the Seneca Falls movement and what would become the national push towards women's suffrage in the United States by the 1920s. Also, American society began to turn towards temperance. For many, this movement was an attempt to purify a nation they believed had turned to vice and squalor. This then brings us to the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. It placed massive restrictions on Chinese immigration. There was also a great deal of terror and intimidation imposed upon the Chinese during the life of this act. Check out the following documents to dig deeper into the issues. Chinatown declared a nuisance in 1880 the struggle for married women's rights in 1880, and Susan B. Anthony on suffrage and equal rights in 1901. At this point, we must go back to the West. In 1849, the gold rush starts in Sacramento, California. Hundreds of thousands of people continue to stream West with the haze of golden riches clouding their minds. And eventually, the mining of gold is industrialized and corporations take a stronger foothold in the industry that created Central and Northern California's largest cities. With that, a few other items must be put on the list for this discussion of the ever-expanding West. First, we have the Purchase of Alaska in 1867, which continued territorial expansion and would eventually be the first state to give residents dividends on state-run oil sales. Second, the Transcontinental Railroad was completed less than 20 years following the folks in covered wagons hightailing across the country for golden riches. There is a railroad that makes travel, communication, and the distribution of goods and services more widespread and a whole lot more efficient. We should also mention the Dawes Severalty Act of 1887, which was built to ensure American Indian assimilation into mainstream society. The folks that took part in Dawes also got the rights of American citizenship. As a form of resistance to assimilation, tribes established a way of fighting back. The ghost dance was a ritual dance that signified the persistence of a tribe's people regardless of the actions of the white American incursion. There are many excellent documents on the Gilder Lehrman website that will help you deepen your understanding of the nuances and details of these concepts. They include Horace Greeley, Go West in 1871, Indian Wars, The Battle of Washita, 1868, the official photograph from the Golden Spike Ceremony in 1869, the Grange Movement of 1875, and the Great West Illustrated in 1869. Let's take a moment and turn to the New South. I mean the one just following the Civil War and Reconstruction. So we've seen the Civil War, we've discussed the concept of Reconstruction and its many tentacles, but now we have to dig into the redevelopment of the South as the nation moved rapidly towards the turn of the century. As freed men and women confront the post-Civil War South, one of the sole options was to start sharecropping. Former slaves would work others' land for rather meager compensation that typically came in the form of surplus crops rather than monetary income. Another advent of this new South was Jim Crow. These unwritten, often violent codes were established to maintain a segregated society that closely mirrored that of a pre-Civil War South. African American voters were beaten and intimidated if they came to the polls, or even lynched if they were suspected of encroaching on any aspect of white Southern society. This era also saw the famous Plessy v. Ferguson case in 1896. The judiciary involved itself in issues of interstate commerce with a decision that stated the separate but equal doctrine. As long as conditions were deemed equal, segregation was perfectly acceptable in the eyes of the court, whether on a train or even in a school. There is so much more to uncover about all of this, so be sure to check out the Gilder Lehrman websites for documents including Sharecropper Contract in 1867, Frederick Douglass on Jim Crow in 1887, Campaigning for the African American Vote in Georgia in 1894. Now we come to our final key concept, big change. During the Gilded Age of American history, a new culture emerged in the United States, one influenced by a new kind of affluence, and one colored by the fight for common people to attain the most basic rights as workers and contributors to society. A couple of quick bits to remember. During the Gilded Age, civil service in the U.S. changed. The spoil system was abolished, and government work was given on the basis of merit. Currency issues rose to national attention. There was a great debate over the basis of the American currency and whether it should be on either a silver or gold standard. Tariffs became an issue of the day as well. As U.S. manufacturing concepts became more global, a system needed to be developed in order for U.S. companies to remain at the top of their economic game. New foreign competition would be subject to rather large taxes if they wished to import their goods into the American economy. Though the Gilded Age could be seen as a shining moment in American history, there are still many issues that arose and painted the era in a slightly different way. First, we have political scandal. 
Though it was happening for most of its existence, scandals involving money and politics took over the hearts and minds of the populace. Look to the Credit Mobilier incident of 1872 for a good example of railroad magnates consolidating their power and giving lucrative kickbacks to members of the U.S. government from their profits. There was also economic crisis at home. The Panic of 1893 showed us what real economic downturn could look like. With overspeculation, railroad companies experienced great failure. As a result, banks collapsed and the U.S. economy began to crumble. Unemployment shot into the double digits and life in America mirrored a more contracted existence. Farming suffered and workers in larger industries began to walk off the job as a result of poor conditions and dismal pay. There was also a populist response to this crisis. Many believed that the Panic of 1893 and its massive economic impacts were a result of American economy controlled by few, very powerful corporate interests. As a move away from this monopolistic economy, the populist movement developed a political platform that was based in an antitrust sentiment and one that moved to better the lives and the wallets of mainstream Americans. We also have to think about electoral politics with the election of 1896. William McKinley completes a landslide win for the presidency, and while William Jennings Bryan was defeated, his campaign made a mark on electoral history. Be sure to check out his Cross of Gold speech from 1896. Well, there we have it. This is a ton of information to process, but continue to immerse yourself in the materials at ap.gilderlerman.org, including William Cullen Bryant opposes the protective tariff in 1876, the Panama Canal proposal in 1881, People's Party campaign posters from 1892, John Mosby on the silver issue in 1895, William Jennings Bryant and the ideals of the Declaration of Independence also in 1895. Hey there, I'm here with Tim Bailey, Education Director of the Gilder Lerman Institute for American History, to go over the second set of historical thinking skills for the AP U.S. History exam. Hey Tim. <laughs> Hi David. Um, so, second set of skills. Skill two, comparison and contextualization. So the first component here it says is comparison. Historical thinking involves the ability to describe, compare, and evaluate in various chronological and geographical contexts multiple historical developments within one society and one or more developments across or between different societies. Historical thinking also involves the ability to identify, compare, and evaluate multiple perspectives on a given historical experience. This thinking skill pushes you to compare and contrast societies over time and place using multiple perspectives to inform your work. For example, you could look at the evolving attitudes in the American South, from that of a newly freed slave to that of the plantation owner. Ah, oh, all right. Okay, how about this? Contextualization. It says here, historical thinking involves the ability to connect historical developments to specific circumstances in a time and place, and to broader regional, national, or global processes. So this one takes us from the micro to the macro. You need to be able to look at how to apply your knowledge of specific instances to a larger discussion of equally important ideas. For example, you could explore the issue of slavery from the perspective of a single slave on a southern plantation to the larger discussion of the global context of slavery when dealing with the ins and outs of the transatlantic slave trade. Wow. Does that make sense? It does, it does. All right. Thank you, David. Absolutely, and thank you, Tim. And remember to go back to the Gilder Lehrman website to get more resources and information to be successful with the AP U.S. History exam.